Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. I'm Jordan Rabel. I'm Caleb Terrence. <laughs> uh, for the first time in maybe Caleb Can't Read history, we're Absolutely. not drinking beer. Yeah, I'm not drinking beer right now. It's <laughs> it's it's all water currently. Um, yeah, what is it like nine in the morning? So. But dude, well, that wouldn't have stopped us. But dutiful listener, please be rest assured, we drank plenty last night. Uh, <laughs> it was it was it was a makeup sesh for what we would have to go through today, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we could put it that way. Drinking yesterday for what I would have to do tomorrow. I don't know. Are you sure you don't want to record tomorrow? Like we could be Mm-mm. not. <sighs> nope. Nine a.m. with a mild hangover. No. Doing it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right, man, let's fucking do it. What do we got? Let's razzle dazzle, shall we? Mm -hmm. Herman Melville was born August 1st, 1819 in New York City to his father, Alan, and his mother, Maria. Alan was around 31 years old and Maria was about 28 because I knew that you would probably ask. Herman was the third of eight children and both his maternal and paternal uh, grandfathers were major players during the American Revolution. His grandfather on his mother's side, Peter Gansevoort, stood fast against British forces who laid siege on Fort Stanwix in New York with an army of only 700 men. The siege took three weeks before the British retreated and more than half of Peter Gansevoort's men had died as a result. And the grandfather on his dad's side, Thomas Melville, took part in the Boston Tea Party. Thomas Melville sent his son Alan to France when he was a young man with the goal to become a merchant which he did, and later became very rich by importing French goods into America. You know, his grandfather was one of those guys who didn't want Obama re-elected. <laughs> what? What do you... Boston Tea Party. Uh, do you remember that short-lived thing where they're like, we're the new Tea Party. Oh, are you going to do things to uh Jordan, that was fucking weak. You're, you're weak. I'm actually quite strong. You showed me shirtless I'll pictures beat you last night. Oh, yeah. I was pretty drunk. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of this. <laughs> now, the Melville family wealth meant that little Herman was never without multiple servants at any point in time and was constantly moving to bigger and better houses before eventually staying for a while at a house on Broadway at the age of 10. However, despite their good business, both Alan and Maria spent well beyond their means. They would borrow money from their parents many times with no regard for the money ever actually running out. But here's the thing. They didn't just take the money. They said they were going to pay it back eventually, like good little liars. But of course, they never did. Because of this, Maria's parents finally stopped and said that they wouldn't lend out any more money until they had been paid back what was already owed, which back then was $20,000, but in today's money reaches almost half a million. Mm. That's a sizable <laughs> a sizable <laughs> withdrawal from the Bank of Lies. And although Herman's parents had their financial worries, they never let their eight children know about it. They were actually good parents. The kids led very emotionally fulfilling lives. They were given everything they needed, including a good education. Though when little Herman was seven years old, he and contracted scarlet fever. Emotional, emotionally fulfilling? That was the way you chose to describe that? Uh, what would you call it? I, I not that I don't know just just fulfilling. I don't like think you didn't need you, to add in emotionally fulfilling. You could just say fulfilling. I feel like you don't know what emotionally fulfilling means. <laughs> I probably You're just do like, not. <laughs> just like what the fuck is uh, that? <laughs> that hurts. That hurts. <laughs> please go on, please. Uh, so Herman was bedridden for a long time with scarlet fever, and when he finally recovered, he kind of had to mentally start from scratch. Sorry, start from scratch. Not just mentally, but... Shut up. <laughs> According to his father, he was, quote, very backwards in speech and somewhat slow in comprehension. But eventually, Herman got better. So much better, in fact, that he began to far exceed the other students and even enrolled in the English department of his school. But with no help coming from either of their parents at this point, Alan and Maria were finding that their elaborately large house on Broadway was kind of hard to afford. And so in 1830, Allen moved the family to Albany, New York, where he worked in the fur trade. From here, Herman attended the Albany Academy, which was, and still is today, a college preparatory school. And Herman was awarded as one of the school's finest scholars at the age of 12. However, the good education wouldn't last, as even by this time, Allen and Maria couldn't keep up with the small tuition fees and had to take their children out of school altogether. 
What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> what? <laughs> if you want me to say something funny, you have to say something interesting. No, I was just drawing the parallels. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> you grew up poor. <laughs> no, my parents didn't borrow any money. No, they should have. <laughs> <laughs> they would have. <laughs> the bank was closed that day. Wait, they pulled up in their van and their grew up poor implies that I'm not currently poor, <laughs> and that is not true. <laughs> I used to be poor, also currently, but used to be as well. Mm-hmm. In December of 1831, Alan Melville tra- uh, traveled from New York City back to Albany. A distance of about 160 miles by open carriage for two days in freezing temperatures. Is that just like a trailer? <laughs> what? The- An open carriage is just a trailer. It's not a carriage. It's a carriage. What are you talking about? Open carriage? Oh, you mean like a like a trailer, like on a fucking truck or something? Yeah, like uh, a okay, fucking basically. trailer. Yeah. yeah. They're called carriages. It's because not- you're not trailing it, but I guess you trail it behind <laughs> horses. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. You know what? <laughs> fucking sure. <laughs> It's just a platform. It doesn't have the little roof or the little doors. It's a fucking trailer. It's not a fucking carriage. Yeah, he had his fucking paint back there in a in a on a work ladder. Yeah. It was his his open carriage. Yeah. Well he made the journey, but afterwards began slipping into delirium, slowly losing his cognition. By the end of the month, on january twenty eighth, eighteen thirty two, Alan Melville passed away, just two months shy of his fiftieth birthday. It was after this that at the behest of Herman's older brother, Gansevoort, that the mother Maria added an E to the end of their last name, thus going from M-E-V-I-L-L to M-E-V-I-L-L-E, and I have no idea why. I really looked for it, and everyone was just like, it was a thing that they decided to do. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. She's just on this right now, and I don't feel like arguing with her. I feel like maybe it was because they were borrowing so much money that they were like, oh, we're fake wealthy. Well, we got to have an E at the end to show a little bit more, uh, I don't know, French, maybe. Maybe it it made them harder to look up for, like, debtors and shit. Doubt it. Hey, where are they? They're in that big fucking house that they can't afford. (laughs) Yeah. Also, like, how hard was it to, like, you know, I think we've gone over this before, like, run away from debt at that time. You could, yeah. Like, you could just, like, walk to the next (laughs) Actually, maybe that was why they... Ultimately decided to leave New York City is like, oh, we can't afford to live off of Broadway. We'll have to go to Albany. And it's like, maybe it's because you owed more money than just your parents, you know? Yeah, probably <laughs> like, they weren't just borrowing money from the parents, right? Oh, why did he decide to only to make that trip in freezing temperatures 160 miles in just two days? Was he running? No. <laughs> just for funsies. It was, you know, I really want to see my On the kids. back of the trailer. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Should have just ridden the fucking horse. <clears throat> Now, the death of the breadwinner of the Melville family was a hard hit to the rest of them. Herman's brother, Gansevoort, went into the fur business like his father, while Maria stuck herself inside the first Reformed Dutch church and pretty much only made time for prayer, not for any of her kids. Herman, however, at the age of fucking 12, went to his uncle, who was the director for the New York State Bank, and got him a job as a desk clerk. (laughs) A cute child as he may have been, doing the same workload as grown-ups, Herman still made a child's pay. He would take home a salary of $150 a year. Mm. That's just under $4,000 in today's money. <laughs> Which I find a little cute. They're just like, <laughs> yeah, you can work as fucking hard as us, yeah, but you get fucking labor, peanuts. <laughs> child labor is adorable, Jordan. <laughs> Why is my check on lined paper and written in crayon? We thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Have some animal crackers. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, he basically didn't even need that job. Uh, 4000 a year isn't going to pull in jack shit. But in a mere two years, Herman was actually seen as an equal within the bank at just the age of 14. And at this point, his brother Gansevoort was also doing well enough within the fur trade that he had his own skins factory. However, Ugh, in May of 18... 18- that place sounds fucking gnarly. It's not rubbers. <laughs> yeah, no. No, that wouldn't be as gnarlesome as just like a factory of animal skins. <laughs> what smells? It's me. It's you too. <laughs> we all smell. It's all skins all the time. Oh, fuck, dude. The amount of salt that they had to go through, I bet. I wonder what, like, did they just, oh, yeah, no, because I'm sure they dished the bodies and then just had the skins. Oh, fuck. So at least it wasn't just like rotting stuff that they were just rotting throwing carcasses. out back. I feel like it's just a pile that they have like a straight yeah. down. Yeah, I don't oh, think they just fuck. had a sack of animals in the back there's of a trailer butchers out, just out. There's like, Albany butchers out there just like, yeah, that's a good skunk, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck. Fucking, I bet. <laughs> However, 
In May of 1834, the fur factory burned down. Starting from scratch, Gansevoort could no longer afford employees, so he pulled his brother Herman out of the banking business to help him run the skin factory as his only employee. I bet that smelled very interesting. Oh, fucking... Mm. Yeah, oh, dude. especially when it burns down. <laughs> All yeah, the yeah, singed this, hair. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, There's a bunch of fucking singed hair and whatever the fuck they were treating the skins with. I don't know what hell it looks like, but I sure know what it smells like, son. Yeah, I fucking... Oh, oh fuck. Yeah, don't they have to oh. treat it with, like, piss or something? It's, I know they had oh, to do that with, like, right. leather back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just right. just a boiling a piss thing. and animal hair. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, yeah. Oh, man. That's pretty much how I cook. You um, don't cook. Yeah, it's the reason why. Which is very is this surprising for someone hair, of your size. Is this piss and hair soup? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had what I had on hand, whatever. But Herman was still a child during all of this. He wasn't like other 14-year-olds who pretend they're tough shit and practically an adult. No, he knew he was a kid and knew he was missing out on the formal education that other kids were getting. So by the next year, in March of 1835, the family pulled together enough money to send him back. This probably came from a bit of cash that his mom, Maria, got from her mother selling her own estate, and not from the inheritance that Maria received when Alan's parents died. Because as it turned out... Alan was still secretly getting loans from his folks while he was alive, behind Maria's back, of course, hadn't paid any of it back by the time he died. So when Alan's parents died, Maria got the sum of $20. Nice. <laughs> so when Herman went back to school, he crammed whatever knowledge he could find to make up for lost time. This is what led to him becoming a big fan of Shakespeare. He particularly liked the scenes with the witch and Macbeth, which he liked to act out at home and scare his little sisters. He also had a particular interest in books that talked about travels in faraway lands like India. And the best books that did this were travelogues written by sailors. So even though he was stuck in New York, Herman got a fair bit of knowledge on his geography. But two years later in 1837, the money in the Melville household ran out yet again, and Herman was withdrawn from school for a second time. This would turn out to be the right to be right on time for an economic depression in America that was called the Panic of 1837. The Melville family would now need to move somewhere even cheaper, so the family moved to Massachusetts, where Herman would get a job teaching at the age of 17. He taught all subject matters to around 30 students, some of which were the same age as him. But he only taught for one semester before the family moved back to Albany, New York. Back in his home state, Although he was already a skilled banker, teacher, and tanner, Herman was unable to find a job, so he focused a bit on writing, something that he didn't take too seriously. But with his first published essay called Fragments from a Writing Desk, published by a local newspaper, the general consensus was that Herman was a show-off. He had allusions to Shakespeare, John Milton. I don't even care about this. <laughs> he had all these allusions to, like, fucking Walter Scott, Lord Byron, uh, it was well written, yes, but everyone knew what he was doing. He was trying to prove that he was a learned man. And I guess that just didn't sit well with a lot of people. Yeah, people generally don't like it when you just start jacking yourself uh, off. Pretty much. Well, I mean, depends on <laughs> who's watching. You gotta ask. <laughs> what? Yeah, Fucking yeah, I just, read, man. No, I just, I remember. Read, I have shit to do today, Jordan. This is why we don't do it in the morning. Go, I just go, 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 go. opening go. up a bar bathroom and there's a dude with his pants down around his ankles and he's covering his crotch and like, there's stalls in the bathroom. He knew what he's doing. Uh, well, and he's just like, sorry, sorry, but I'm just like drunk and like staring as he's like trying to shut the door and the door keeps opening on him and I'm just like standing <laughs> staring just like, huh. You know, he's like, excuse me. That's, fuck, excuse me, you know, and it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> now, when the family first moved to Massachusetts, Herman's older brother, Gansevoort, stayed behind in New York City to try his hand at becoming a lawyer. With the family now back in the state, Gansevoort wrote a letter to Herman showing that he was doing fairly well, and while he couldn't necessarily get, job, uh, get Herman a job as a lawyer... He did hear from a client that there was a whaling ship in harbor looking for able-bodied men. The very next day, Herman Melville traveled the 160 miles to town and signed on the St. Lawrence. The ship was on its way to Liverpool, England, 
and Herman would make the four-month-long journey there and back. Jesus, there wasn't another fucking job? Uh, no. <laughs> what the fuck? Well, remember, he's a banker, a teacher, a tanner. There's nothing for him. And, I mean, his brother was showing it. Like, fuck yeah, I used off. to be a tanner, too, and now I'm a lawyer. Like, how hard is it to become a baker? You know? <laughs> like, Just go find do something. literally <laughs> anything. Fucking landscaping. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Like, Jesus. <laughs> Well, Wait, fucking tables. Don't jump on a voyage across the ocean in a whaling exactly. ship. Exactly, like, yeah. Well, I'll see y'all later in four months. Hopefully, if it's uh, five months and you don't hear from me, then we died. Like, <laughs> That's a very well, high probability of this. The St. Lawrence finally arrived back in the United States on October 1st, 1839, as he had just turned 20 years old. And apparently his time on the St. Lawrence was very eye-opening for Herman. You see, when he first boarded the St. Lawrence... He saw himself as the son of a gentleman and demanded to be treated as such. Oh, I bet it went great. <laughs> well, you, you pretty quickly found out that that was not going to happen. <laughs> he also, oh, I bet that was fun. Oh, dude, he... he. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. He had a hell of a time uh, in the cold because the jacket he wore was for looks to show off that he was a gentleman. Oh, he's a little fashionista. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had no practicality. And it was a big fucking mistake if you're saying, like, there's water on him. It's fucking freezing temperatures. It's and pretty he's fucking like, dumb for a smart guy. <laughs> you know? He's also 20, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Right. Not to say 20-year-olds are, like, inherently stupid, but it's, like, no, that's are. very cocksure, you know? 20-year-olds are very fucking it, stupid. It's him just being like, I demand to be made a gentleman. And they're just these guys <laughs> are fucking smoking and just, like, burns on him and just... <laughs> okay <laughs> mistress hand us the rope stop calling me that <laughs> that same year in 1839 herman melville ran into a published account by a sailor about a particular whale he ran into the year before before called mocha dick <laughs> <laughs> We're not even in, into the full title. Ah! Okay, go, 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 go. I'm so scared of mocha dicks. <laughs> mocha dick, or the the white whale of the Pacific. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> a leaf from a manuscript journal, which was about his run-in with a whale with albinism. Now, the writer of this tale... What the uh, fuck did they name the white whale Mocha? Um, I think he was by the Mocha Islands or something like that. It, it was so like Southern very po- I, bad I know. Call. Well, your your worry is with Mocha, not the dick part. Uh, <laughs> I would just like it to be better described. Call him large dick. <laughs> yeah, call it the big penis. The, the big white dick. There <laughs> call we go. it big peepee. <laughs> <laughs> now, the writer of this tale, a well-known inventor by the name of Jeremiah N. Reynolds, wasn't Wait, yeah, why the fuck was it Dick? Why was Dick anywhere in that name? Hold I, up. That's just a thing that they called whales. They called whales dicks. Yeah, especially if they got a lot of spermaceti. So there was just a whole fucking industry, and they were all talking with each other about tracking down terms, dicks? Terms have gone different over time. No okay? fucking way was everybody <laughs> calling whales dicks for like... Ah, oh, there goes a fine dick right there. Larger than I've ever seen. Well, yeah. <laughs> gotta haul that dick to port. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to tire this dick out and strap it to the ship? (laughs) (laughs) Going to drag this dick into harbor and wow every lady on port. You know how much money we can make with this dick? (laughs) (laughs) This dick's going to keep this village fed for like four months. (laughs) Look, we got, there's going to be like two more episodes where we can make these This is going to be so good. (laughs) I'm so excited. (laughs) Now, Jeremiah N. Reynolds, the guy who wrote it, he wasn't necessarily a writer, but he was for sure an eccentric. He fully believed Ascent- in... Th- he's he's an eccentric. Eccentric? Well, a little, you know... Are you saying that right? Yeah, he's an eccentric. Like eccentric. Eccentric? Eccentric, I think, yeah. One of us is wrong here. It might be me, but Does I'm pretty sure Does that make you sure uncomfortable? You. Shut fuck off. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to say it's me because I'm white. Now, <laughs> so for instance... He fully believed in the hollow earth theory. (laughs) Like he was like, there's more adventure down there, but seeing a white whale is actually not all that uncommon. Albinism in whales is documented even today. And while it is a rare sight, it's not like it's one in a million, but anyway, the tale of Mocha Dick is the story of an infamous whale that frequents just off the Mocha islands. If I was a pimp, that would be my name. Mocha Dick. (laughs) (laughs) We name you small peepee. No, my street name's Mocha Dick. (laughs) 
No, you're small, baby. <laughs> So he was a whale that frequented just off the Mocha Islands on the coast of Chile. He was about 70 feet in length and was, for all intents and purposes, a friendly whale. He was known to swim alongside ships in a friendly manner, so close that you could see all the battle scars on his back. But at the first sign of aggression from whatever ship he was escorting, Mocha Dick would be known to body slam boats. And I don't mean that he would just sideswipe them either. He would become fully airborne and just land on fucking boats. So he'd, so he'd become fully erect, if you will. F- uh, uh, that that Willie or Dick, that Dick is. Yeah, fully we don't in need there. to call it anything different. <laughs> Can you imagine the Dick on Dick? He was actually a very superstitious whale for a lot of whalers. Like you don't fuck with Mocha Dick. Jeremiah Reynolds did though. He fucking killed that whale, and he wrote about it. And when Herman Melville re- uh, read it, he thought, oh, neat, and just put the book down. But what the tale of Mocha Dick did for Herman was act as proof that there really weren't any jobs for him unless he was whaling. So he went back to Massachusetts from New York City and signed back up on another ship, this one called the Akushnet. He was given an advance of $84, about 2700 today. And as was tradition... For a sailor in New Bedford before they shipped out, listen to a sermon held in a chapel called the Seamen's Bethel. Stop. (laughs) They are seamen, okay? Yeah, that's what's funny. (laughs) This chapel is known for having the names of sailors that die on their journeys etched into the fucking marble on the inside of the church. With the sermon over, Herman set sail on January 3rd, 1841 at the age of 21. Now, the process of whaling back in the day is as follows, and I'm going to try not to go too much into the gory details here. You had someone Why on... Why not? Eh, it's, it's a little... With everything we talk about on this fucking podcast, yeah, you think people I, are going to be concerned about gory details of fucking whaling? I don't like animals. We have whole harm. episodes about the Holocaust, Jordan. <laughs> yeah, I just don't like harming animals. Oh, that's the line? It is. Oh, I hate you. I'd eat human meat. You know this about me. Why would you eat human meat? That's way worse. No, that's curiosity. No, it's not. That's fucked up. I'd eat whale too, though. Yeah, of so course. Anyway. That's not a human, Jordan. <laughs> Fucking edge lord, shut the fuck up. Read. <laughs> so you had someone on the masthead, usually on a rotating shift that would last about two hours, looking out for any water spouting or color differences in the water that may indicate a group of whales. And on a clear day, these guys would be able to see whales breaching from upwards of eight miles away. But you couldn't go after just any old whale. A trained lookout would be able to tell just from the shape of the spout and how big the vapor coming out of the spout, what kind of whale it was, and if they were big enough to bother pursuing, which I find insane. Just the fucking the water coming up and they're like, nah, that's not a good whale. That's a shitty type of whale. (laughs) That's pretty impressive. Yeah, you just learn to vibe it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like how you look at a tree and you're just like, oh, that's a death trap. It looks like a tree to me. (laughs) That's the trick, man. They're all death traps. (laughs) That's my secret, Captain. I'm always horny. If it was... <laughs> <What>? <laughs> if it was determined that the whale was worth it, they would call out the famous catchphrase, There she blows. From there, the whale boats would be launched. Smaller rowboats that usually held about five men. Get on the dick-catching boat. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get that dick. Meanwhile, another five sailors would be left on the main ship. And here's a weird thing I didn't know. Whales apparently have some pretty good hearing. So the whale boats had to not just be fast, but they had to paddle quietly, too. If the winds were favorable, they'd set up a small sail aboard each whale boat to get closer to the whale. Now, the harpoon was not actually intended to kill the whale. It was merely made to stick to the whale so the whalers could follow them on a line. And I don't think Herman was ever a harpooner, but... How the fuck do you get your bearings back in the middle of the ocean after getting drug around by a whale? Oh, I'll, I'll go. I'll get into that. You're you're basically getting followed by the boat. And sometimes uh, you went a bit faster than it, and that was trouble. But unluckily for Herman's crew, the harpoon gun wouldn't be invented for about another 10 years at this point. And it's not like the whale's skin is made of butter. You had to toss that motherfucker way deep into the skin to latch on. Once the first harpoon was struck, the whale boats would quickly paddle away from the whale as its thrashing could easily kill everyone in the surrounding area. Also, to anyone asking why the whale wouldn't simply dive away from its attackers instead of swimming away, they do. 
The harpoons are tied to an immense amount of rope, and when the whalers are at a safe distance away from the whale, they just let the whale plunge under the water while still having plenty of line left and wait for the whale to come back up for air. If the whale tried to swim away, it would pull all the available whale boats along with it in what was called a Nantucket sleigh ride. I fucking hate that term. Don't smile about that, man. That's sick. <laughs> That's, I fucking hate that. I really do. <laughs> hey, man, they needed whales for stuff. For lamps? <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need... I don't know. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, pretty much, like... <laughs> What's it for? Lamps. Don't you have candles? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Because it's rad as fuck. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I'm sorry if metal hasn't been invented yet and I have to do something fucking metal. <laughs> well, the goal this whole time was just to actually tucker the whale out. So they let it just go on for miles. At some point, the whale boats would be able to drift right up to the whale when it was too tired to swim any longer. In which case, the lancer, who actually carried a ginormous lance anywhere between... 15 to 30 feet in length would stick this long piece of steel into the whale's head or chest to either puncture the brain, heart, or lungs. After a bit of thrashing, what was called a flurry, the whale would finally die. How close did he have to get? Oh man, he had to get real close. Oh, he's, he's on top of it. Oh, and now there's a fucking (laughs) lance attached to it while it's thrashing around and you're next to the fucking lance. Yeah. Oh shit. (laughs) That's the flurry. Now it's not as, uh, it's not as strong of a, of a, of a death rattle as when you first have the harpoons in it. But it's because it's just tuckered out. It's just like, you know, and it just gives a kind of a shiver, but it could fucking still kill you, I'm sure. I mean, if it's like that thing in Call of Duty, you know, you're dead, but you're on the ground. They give you the pistol and maybe you could have one last shot as a whale. I mean, I feel like maybe I just try to bite the guy. You know, I'm just like, fuck you. One last one last run, you know, you understand. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, from here, the main ship would sail to the whale boat's location, or if you were really unlucky and the ship lost sight of you, you'd have to tow the motherfucker back. Now, although this next step of... I hope you picked the right fucking direction, Jesus. Uh, yeah, I mean, depending on how many hours you were out, I would guess that there was a dude on each whale boat to basically look at the location of the sun at the point and be like, this is the location we need to go Fuck, in. everybody's phones are dead. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any signal out there. How are we supposed to get Captain Hardy? <laughs> from here... Uh, let's see. Oh, this, this next step of the processing, the whale could take hours or even days. You had to act fast on this. Sharks were always looking for an easy meal. The carcass would be lifted up onto one side of the ship from its tail where workers would peel the hide in the, uh, of the whale in long strips, like a fucking orange. Holy shit. Were they having to like fight sharks and shit? They were biting the bottom of it while they were doing this? (laughs) Well, it was, it was usually lifted like from a mast. Is there any other fucking way to light a lamp? (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Fucking A. In order to get the, can we just make a fire? (laughs) It's fine. God damn. That's fair enough. <laughs> like, we have candles. I don't like candles. How about a fire? Yeah, those are bomb. <laughs> like, just, can we just, just get fires? some fucking firewood and use that like a, <laughs> uh, like a torch? Uh, shit, dude. In order to get the whole hide off in one go, they would use 15-foot poles to cut through the skin. Like it would be 15 feet deep into the whale to fucking gut it. The skins would then be thrown on deck where they were boiled in a giant pot and the blubber processed into oil. But the real pay dirt was in the head of the whale. Spermaceti, from which the sperm whale gets its name, easy, rests in the forehead of the whale. It is the purest oil and easily worth five times more than regular whale oil. Usually, once you were done with whatever was of use to you uh, from the whale's body, you would decapitate them, leaving the head strung upside down while you just dump the body into the ocean. And what you do to get to the spermaceti is you'd have a guy hang upside down from a rafter and scoop the oil out of the head and pass the bucket up like fucking Jackie Chan doing those sit-ups in Drunken Master. He, like, dunks the water, passes except it up. Except it's a whale head. Yeah, <laughs> except it's a whale head, and it's a big fucking bucket. So it's like, you're fucking ripped. <laughs> Depending on the size of the whale, there could be up to 500 gallons of spermaceti in the whale's head. That's a fucking fortune. So, yeah, they're just taking out brain oil, basically. Now, just because the whale was dead doesn't mean that the danger was over for the sailors. Again, there were sharks dicking around these ships for days or however long it took you to get the job done. And because of all the oil on the deck, it was not unlikely for someone to slip right the fuck off the ship and into shark infested waters. Oh, and they're all murder horny for the blood. (laughs) Hell yeah. Jesus. (laughs) 
Also, those long strips of skin from the whale could easily crush or injure a person. And perhaps the worst of these, if your ship got hit by a rogue wave and tottered the boat a little bit, the giant cauldron that the sailors are feeding the skins into could tip over and cover the entire crew in boiling hot oil. <laughs> and this isn't water. You can't just wash the herd away. If anything, it's going to spread over your entire body. And where the fuck are you going to rinse yourself anyway? In the shark water? In at least one instance, a ship had the cauldron knocked over and the fire spread throughout the entire ship, burning it down. And something else to consider was the smell. There was no getting rid of it. And legend says that... You need a lot of piss for that much skin. (laughs) Well, we've been peeing on it for days. Legend says that Seaside Towns... All right, boys, dicks out. Seaside Towns knew when a whaling ship was coming to port, like from the horizon. (laughs) They're just like, oh, fuck, here we go. (laughs) Mm. Uh, That's good H2O. I don't know, dude. The H2O in your house tastes kind of weird today. I peed in it. Yeah, No, it tastes a bit cummy. I don't know what it is. Oh, that wasn't... Dude. It wasn't... Uh, no, seriously, taste this water. No. Maybe taste the it. fault is with you. My, 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 my water tastes fine. Taste it. It tastes cummy. Why does your cum taste like water? I don't know, man. Anyway, go on. I'm sorry for the question. <laughs> now, during Herman's particular whaling voyage, the Akushnet would regularly do what was called gamming on the waters. Gamming is when two ships met on the ocean and set anchor real fucking close to each other. So wait, the two wait, wait, crews, start up, start, start up. <clears throat> the Akushnet, what uh, the ship that Herman was on, mm-hmm. they would do gamming All right. when you get just real fucking close to each other. So the two crews could talk. Sometimes it meant that planks could be set across the gap of the two ships. So the captains and crew could intermingle. And it was on one of these gamming sessions. Yeah, we need more piss. <laughs> <laughs> that Herman met the son of a man named Owen Chase. Now, Owen Chase was famous, not for his prowess as a whaler necessarily, but for being one of the eight survivors from the 20-man crew of a ship called the Essex. Basically, what happened was that the whaling ship, the Essex, small for its length of only 88 feet, departed on its final voyage on August 12, 1819, with a crew of 20 men. This is less than two weeks after Herman was born, by the way, so this was a while back. Now, this was to be a a two-and-a-half-year journey. Fucking two days in, the Essex was hit by a huge storm that put the ship into a big need for repairs. But the captain figured they were fine and kept going. <laughs> yeah, that's probably fine. You know what that thing's rated for? Dude, two days in and you're ready for fucking like <laughs> for like a huge voyage. Like I don't we're know only about two that. days in, man. Maybe we could just turn around. We're nowhere near the halfway point. <laughs> two and a half years on the like. Oh, yeah, we're fine. Their usual whaling spots were depleted of whales, so they figured they'd we'll go... repair it. With what fucking wood, man? <laughs> <laughs> so they figured they'd go further into the Pacific to try their luck there. Now, a lot of the crew was a bit hesitant about this, mostly because they were afraid of cannibals, of course, but they still went. There's a lot of cannibals in the ocean. They were literally really afraid of cannibals. <laughs> By the way, it wasn't just the captain that was an idiot, but his whole crew was full of dipshits. The Essex had docked on an island void of people in the Galapagos Islands, and one of the guys played a little prank on the others by setting the fucking island on fire. <laughs> it led to the near Classic. it led to the near extinction of a type of mockingbird and a type of sea tortoise. So he's a fucking whaler, man. <laughs> he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> we could have eaten those. <laughs> I don't think the uh, no, they're not. That's not on their mind. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. On November 20th, 1820, a little after a year into their voyage, the Essex spotted a large sperm whale that was around 85 feet in length. Remember, the Essex is only 88 feet in length. They spotted the whale because it was directly facing the ship motionless. Then once it was spotted, the whale swam under, then lifted the whole ship up from underneath. Then the whale swam back and charged the ship. As Owen Chase would later write, fuck that thing is pissed (laughs) off. (laughs) Quote, it appeared with tenfold fury and vengeance in his aspect. The surf flew in all directions about him with the continual violent thrashing of his tail, his head about half out of the water. And in that way, he came upon us and again struck the ship. This time, the direct hit from the whale caused enough damage to sink the Essex and the whale was never seen again. The crew of the Essex salvaged what they could from their ship as it slowly sank over the course of the next two days. 
they were 1,200 miles from land. Now, the rest of their story is met with cannibalism, piss drinking, and all-around bad ideas, but for our story, we're going to focus on the aftermath with Owen Chase. So they were the real cannibals all along. Yeah, actually. (laughs) Uh, If you want any more information on the tale of the Essex, I recommend the episode put out by the dollop. Now, anyway, four months after Owen Chase's return to Nantucket, he completed his accounts of his journey in as little as four months. Wait, so that's nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, so that, like, those, that happened. there are aggressive whales sometimes? Uh, yeah, it turns out when you've got, like, decades of whaling, yeah. <laughs> now they're quite friendly. <laughs> Except maybe in Japanese and Norwegian waters. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, they get a little pissed. Get a little pissed sometimes. I that's don't know why. That's a big-ass pissed-off thing. <laughs> So four months after Owen Chase's return to Nantucket, he completed his accounts of his journey in as little as four months with his book, Narrative of the Most Extraordinary and Distressing Shipwreck of the Whale Ship Essex, in 1821. As Owen Chase began to age, his mind subtly went as well. He began hiding food in his attic for fear of starvation before he was institutionalized for the next eight years. But anyway, Herman Melville met this guy's kid, and he gave Herman a copy of his father's book. Herman would later write, quote, The reading of this wondrous story upon the landless sea and close to the very latitude of the shipwreck had a surprising effect upon me. On June 23, 1842, after a year and a half of sailing, Herman Melville and a friend named Toby Green deserted the Akushnet at the French Polynesian islands of Nuka Hiva and stayed there for a couple of months before boarding the ship the Lucianne, another whaling ship headed for Tahiti. Now, the only reason why Herman and Toby would have jumped ship from the Akushnet would be if they felt they were being treated unfairly. It was a very common practice. I mean, you could jump ship for a lot of reasons, but most of the time it was because you were sick of fucking being there. And I just think it's funny because (laughs) what Herman didn't know is that when the Lucianne landed in Nukuhiva, nine crewmen deserted that ship and another eight were placed in irons and held in jail. So he was like... I think I'm being treated unfairly. I'm going to go on this ship while they're like gulagging men. (laughs) Uh, This is because the captain was a complete bastard and the crew tried to cause a mutiny. So Herman just left thinking he'd found something better and instead wound up being much, much worse. Yeah, that's how it goes. Well, Herman soon learned his mistake and ended up being one of 11 people on the Lucienne to cause a mutiny on his way to Tahiti. And as successful as they may have been, mutinies are still fucking illegal. So they were all put in jail as soon as they made it to Tahiti. Basically just gave the keys back to the captain like, hey, I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, Better luck next time. Unionize. Anyway, <laughs> Herman himself was maybe only there uh, for a few weeks before he somehow managed to escape. And since the French Polynesian islands are just freckled across the ocean, he managed to make his way from island to island until he reached the island of Maria. Luckily, he was picked up by a passing ship, and six months later, he was in Maui. And from there, deciding he hadn't had enough of the fucking ocean, he signed up for the U.S. Navy, joining the battleship the USS United States. You know, this wasn't sketch enough. Why don't we get some guns in here? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Hey, they gave me weapons. Cool. Sick. (laughs) This is going to be a much better mutiny. (laughs) Uh, The... The USS United States bounced around South America for a bit before finally landing back in Boston on Wait, October. It was called the USS 3rd. United States. Yeah, it's a dumb it name. It's called the United <laughs> it's States. It's called the United, United States. States. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fucking stupid. <laughs> R.I.P. and peace. <laughs> uh, finally landed in Boston on October third, eighteen forty-three. Two weeks later, on October fourteenth, Melville was discharged, and he was finally on his own again at the age of twenty-four. So from the time he left on the Akushnet on January 3rd, 1841, to when he returned on the USS United States on October 14th, 1843, Herman Melville had been away at sea for almost three years. And what did he learn? Well, when he left, he was kind of a pretentious rich boy. Although not rich, he certainly acted like it. He believed he was the essence of authority. Whereas now, having worked with the lower classes and actually lived among them in Polynesia— He had a hatred for authority. He was kind of like the suburban white kid who went on vacation to Jamaica and came back with like a Bob Marley shirt talking about oppression. You know, very eye opening three fucking years. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) pretty much. So when Herman Melville talked with his family again, they were like, hey, we heard you jump ship from the Akushnet. Where the fuck were you? And Herman sat them down and told his family of his adventures. And they were like, 
Holy shit, you ought to write that shit down. Well, we told you that was going to be fucking stupid. Like, <laughs> you fucking idiot. You think you were, like, yeah, did you think you were going to have a good time? It was supposed to be like a four-month journey, idiot. <laughs> we told you to go be a fucking barista or something. Why did you get on the fucking boat? Like, <laughs> So from his tales, Herman worked for the next three years on his first novel. At the age of 26, published by Wiley and Putnam, the book was titled Typey, A Peep at Polynesian Life. The title comes from the Taipei province of Nukahiva and details the four months that Herman spent on the islands. And throughout the book, he doesn't act as if he's an anthropologist or anything, you know, like he's not there for research or trying to understand the differences between people. He's just trying to fucking survive. He fully admits that he ended up there ass over heels with no knowledge of how shit works amongst the Polynesian people or their fucking language. But he did manage to make it out of there alive. And as he's living among the people, he finds a hatred for the European governments that are taking away everything they have for what was basically slave labor. Now, here's the thing. A majority of people had not been to the Polynesian islands. So when people were reading about Melville's experiences there, people were incredulous to believe him. You have to remember, everyone believed Polynesians to be cannibals. And this story was seen as like the real life version of Robinson Crusoe. But that story was known to be fiction at this point. As a matter of fact, the English publisher of the book, John Murray III, was putting the story into his literary journal, Colonial and Home Library, which only posted nonfiction stories of adventure. Oh, well, what did I do? What? I pressed the Bluetooth button. No, no, it's... Oh, God. Wait. Right. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> so John Murray III, he reads this story, and he wrote back to Herman Melville like, You sure? You fucking promised me this happened. Because he only wrote, like, he only published nonfiction. And Herman swore it all happened the way he said it did. And you know what? People have gone out to the Polynesian Islands again and again to try to disprove Herman Melville and his living conditions. And each time, uh, they've been proven fucking wrong. Like, the worst that... that was a whole jumble of... Anyway, go on. People try to disprove that Herman Melville's stories were true. But people go out there and they're like, fuck, it's just like he said it was. Like, the worst that someone had come up with was finding out that he probably at most spent two months in Polynesia and not four months. But I also don't know that Herman was keeping track of the days, you know? People even tried to call out his bullshit by being like, oh, you was, you escaped with some guy named Toby Green? That was the guy you left the uh, Kuznet Yeah, Toby Green, with. that's a real fucking yeah. name. Like, They're like, really? Well, where the fuck is Toby Green then, huh? So people tried to call out Herman's bullshit um, by going on a hunt for Toby Green. And then they fucking found him. <laughs> and he was like, who, Herman? Yeah, everything you put in that book was true. Now, he did probably make some shit up, but I think that's fine because he wasn't stretching the truth to something ridiculous, you know? Like, it was all shit that could have happened. Regardless, typey became an overnight success, and Herman Melville was known as the man who lived among the cannibals. <clears throat> Even though he, again, reiterated, there's no cannibalism. <laughs> hmm. And honestly, Herman didn't like that title, because the people who who would forget his name, although, and just be like, oh yeah, the guy who lived among the cannibals. Herman who? Who the fuck is Herman Melville? Like they, It's kind of like that guy who got his arm trapped in the rock and had to cut it off. The 127 hours guy? Mm-hmm. What's his fucking name? I don't know. Dude. Exactly. He's the guy who got his arm caught in the rock, you know? Yeah. What's Herman his, Melville uh, was just the guy who lived among Polynesians. What's his name? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, no. Okay, whatever. But Herman still enjoyed his, his success. He even managed to get back in touch with Toby Green since people had managed to hunt him down, and they would become pen pals for the next 20 years. And on revised editions of Typey, Herman Melville even wrote a small section in the back called Sequel, The Story of Toby talking about what happened to him once they finally split off. In the summer of the next year, 1847, Herman Melville wrote a, si- a sequel to Typey, explaining his exploits after coming aboard the Lucy Ann while making his way to Tahiti. This book was published by John Murray in England, but uh, now by Harper and Brothers in America, whom he would stay with for the majority of his career. This book was called Omu, A Narrative of Ad- Adventures in the South Seas. Now, whereas before, in Typey, people had questions about some of the things Herman said, like, huh, sounds a lot like what was described in this other book by this other person. Now in Omu, he really was straight up plagiarizing from earlier travelogues written by other people. I mean, he had things that did happen to him. He was imprisoned on the Lucienne. 
he did escape imprisonment in Tahiti, but I guess he felt that the truth just didn't have enough oomph to it. Well, either way, the plagiarism was only found out way later, perhaps not even in his own lifetime. So when Omu came out, it was another hit for him. Yet there were still some critics who didn't believe any of it. Around March of 1847, Herman met a woman named Lizzie Shaw. He would have been about 27 and she around 24. In June of that same year, just three months later, they were engaged, with their marriage made official on August 4th, 1847. They honeymooned in Montreal. Now, Herman had originally asked for Lizzie's hand in marriage when they had practically first met, but Lizzie's dad said no. Oddly enough, this guy was actually engaged to Herman's father, Alan's sister, at one point, but she died before they married. So we got a little excited. I mean, there's no women in the ocean, right? (laughs) Three years? Cousin! Yeah, oh, what, that he was marrying her? It was three months. Oh, no, 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 I just meant he was on in the ocean for three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's prison. fair yeah, that yeah. he's a little excited. Like, oh! <laughs> oh my god, I can't fuck anyone I'm not married to. That's illegal. Oh! I'm just like, I better fucking strap this down. I don't know when I'm gonna, like, lose all women again. <laughs> it could happen. My buddy Toby had a very... Sensual backline. Yeah, if they were just fucking balancing on that line between hypermasculinity and homosexuality. <laughs> it's not it's not gay if you just r- put some rouge on the butt cheeks, you know what I'm saying? Some what? A little bit of rouge. Make a little, a little red makeup. Okay, man. Freshly spanked. And this guy, her uh Lizzie's father, Lemen Lem fuck, Lemuel? Lemuel Shaw was a huge figure in US law. He developed the difference between murder and manslaughter and held a seat as Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court for 30 years. And the thing is, what a lot of Melville scholars have seen is that it's possible that Herman wasn't really trying to get in good with Lizzie, but instead was trying to stay close to her father, Lemuel. Not because he wanted Dick, but a strong fatherly presence, something that he dearly missed from when his father, Alan, passed away. And while Lizzie and Herman were by all accounts a good couple— it seemed like Herman was happy to kind of get a new maid out of Lizzie as well. From one of Lizzie's own letters, she says, quote, It seems sometimes exactly as if I were here for a visit. The illusion is quite dispelled, however, when Herman stalks into my room without even the ceremony of knocking, bringing me perhaps a button to sew on, or some equally romantic occupation. Mm. Mm. What a man. <laughs> a real sigma. <laughs> In March of 1848... Herman released his third book, released in London by a man named Richard Bentley, and a month later in the United States by Harper and Brothers. The book was called Marty, A Voyage Thither. Now, this is Herman's first tale of pure fiction. He puts in a preface of Marty saying that while his first two books were fact, but everyone believed them to be fiction, maybe if he writes fiction, then everyone will see it as fact. Quote, Not long ago, having published two narratives of voyages in the Pacific, which in many quarters were received with incredulity, the thought occurred to me of indeed writing a romance of Polynesian adventure and publishing it as such to whether the fiction might not possibly receive for a variety in some degree the reverse of my previous experience. (laughs) Yeah, if I lived back then, I would have shot myself. <laughs> the guns are just so fucking off, though, that you miss every time. It's just <laughs> direct <fuck>. on your <laughs> chin. Like, oh, fuck it. Damn it. <laughs> I'm going to put my head in an oven. Doesn't work like that either. <laughs> Shit. Like, <laughs> now, this book, while I haven't read it, sounds like a fucking wild. It sounds fucking wild, to be honest. It's just about a guy going from island to island in the Pacific Ocean and running into a bunch of different societies. Like, he lands on one island called Hulu Mulu. And everyone there is all, like, twisted and contorted, and when they see the main character standing straight up, they all freak the fuck out. (laughs) And from what it sounds like, Herman Melville allowed himself to do fiction for the first time really had him run loose. The book switches from a travelogue to an adventure story to a romance, and it was because the book was so loosey-goosey with what it wanted to be that gave Marty some pretty poor reviews. But Herman knew that every author has a low point in their career, so maybe Marty was just his. Quote, These attacks are matters of course and are essential to the building of any permanent reputation, if such would ever prove to be mine. About a year after Marty's release on February 16th, 1849, Lizzie and Herman had their first son, Malcolm Melville. In October of that same year, 
Herman Melville released Redburn, his first voyage, again published by Richard Bentley in London and Harper and Brothers in New York. This was another f- like quote-unquote fiction tale that was really based on a part of Herman's reality. This one is about a young man joining a whaling crew on its way to Liverpool, such as he did. And according to the critics, it was a return to classic Melville style. But to Herman Melville himself, quote, I, the author, know it to be trash and wrote it to buy some tobacco with. You see, the poor sales of Marty and a newborn child left Herman to write Redburn in just under 10 weeks with no proofreading or second drafts. You need a cigarette, you make it happen. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Although his first two books, Typey and Omu, sold well and were well received, Herman could not let go of the criticisms that they were seen as unrealistic. And now that Marty was poorly received and Redburn was a rush job, all that Herman saw in his first four novels were bad things. And this didn't help when he went into his next book either. Once again from Richard Bentley in London and Harper Brothers in New York in 1850, Herman Melville's White Jacket, or The World in a Man of War, was released. Not, not World in a, Inside of a Man of War. But the, uh, it's a Man of War ship, you understand. Are there men inside it? <laughs> Plenty of seamen. Mm-hmm. This was another semi-autobiographical tale, this time based around his experiences working on the USSS as United States states. <laughs> <laughs> and as much as some people attacked Herman's first two novels for supposedly being lies, critics were now able to take a look at something official to prove whether or not Herman was a liar, the naval records for the USS United States. But what they found was that every major event that Herman describes in the story is in the log for the ship. He just changed the names. From an officer getting court-martialed for his overindulgence in alcohol to a man who jumped ship to fight for Peruvian independence and then was allowed back on the ship months later without reprimand. Holy shit, he lived. Yeah, I mean, you can come back. <laughs> well, like, no, they, they wanted to get him in trouble, but the new Peruvian ambassador asked them not to punish him. So everything <laughs> everything was kosher with this guy. They're like, you fucking jump ship to fight for independence. You just want back on the ship. I mean, anybody and cool the, with the Peruvian <laughs> ambassador is cool The ambassador is just like, <laughs> excuse me, he is fine. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, everything was in the logs. Like, that all happened. And I get why people would think that ship's that shit's ridiculous, but it's true. Now, the book was a moderate success, but to Herman, he didn't see it that way. He regarded White Jacket as well as Redburn as, quote, two jobs which I have done for money, being forced it to it as other men are to sawing wood. But while Herman was lamenting the loss of another great story, the one thing his book White Jacket did was completely reform one aspect of U.S. naval law. You see, Herman Melville did not have a good time in the U.S. Navy. Matter of fact, you can apparently feel the anger in White Jacket through his writing. And in particular, the one chapter that Herman focused the most rage towards was chapter 33 called A Flogging. Flogging, the practice of tying a man up to a post and whipping him, was a fairly common occurrence in naval ships back in the day. Don't you do that with new people at your job? (laughs) Time to the tree. Whip them. (laughs) No. (laughs) Not... Officially, no, I'd get in trouble for physical abuse. <laughs> Quit winking at me. <laughs> but the USS United States was very liberal with their floggings. On the first and second days alone that Herman was aboard, there were floggings. He was on the USS United States for a little over a year, and in that time, the ship saw 163 floggings. What the fuck? <laughs> How many people were on the fucking ship? Like two. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the rate of one flogging around every two and a half days. Senator John P. Hale directly quoted White Jacket as his reason for changing the laws in 1850. Mean, <laughs> mean <laughs> what? <laughs> He's like, oh shit, now thank you for bringing this to my attention. Don't, don't, you think, <laughs> don't you think whip him into shape is, that's not just a saying, I mean, it's a real thing, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, I guess, like fucking A. <laughs> Haven't you ever seen those guys that just like carve? You guys one are gonna have whips? to figure out a much less kinky way to discipline these men. Okay, I'm sorry. Get in the trap, sailor. Ugh. We're practicing our shibari today. <laughs> <laughs> String him up, hang him. Oh no, he's looking mighty sexy. Meanwhile, the captain of the USS United States, while Herman was on the ship, Thomas Tom- uh, Captain Thomas Jones was court-martialed, though he later came back with his pay reinstated. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> the cruelty that Herman Melville saw Captain Jones dish out was a direct inspiration to the sadistic characters he created in both White Jacket as well as later novels in his career. By the way, Senator John P. Hale, the guy that outlawed, 
outlawed flogging on ships, his daughter would later go on to be the fiance to John Wilkes Booth. Isn't that fun? Oh, that's a neat little. That's uh, neat. I didn't even know that. Well, fuck you. So <laughs> it didn't take long for me to write it. <laughs> now, mm. over the course of the next of uh, over. Oh, uh, stop that. Okay. Don't give me a boner. No. Now, over the course of the rest of 1850, Herman Melville began writing his most ambitious novel yet. It was to be an adventure novel based on the legends of the sea he'd heard in different fisheries. But a chance meeting helped change the book from the regular fun-loving adventure that Herman was known for into the dark fable it became. In early August of 1850, the Melvilles, as well as some of their literary friends, traveled to Pittsfield, Massachusetts to visit Herman's uncle. When Scarlet Letter author Nathaniel Hawthorne found out that Herman Melville was in town, he quickly went to meet up with him. Turns out that Nathaniel Hawthorne was Herman's number one fan, which I'm sure Herman loved. I mean, at this point, remember, he believes himself to be a very flawed author, despite his popularity. So to have a guy slobbering all over him, he was super into it. Man. <laughs> what? That's know. normal speak. I'll just keep going. So one day, while Herman and Nathaniel are out for a jaunt, they get swept up in the incoming rain and quickly run to shelter. Sounds very romantic. Well, it's just them. Nathaniel has... Oh, wait, are they actually going to get gay? <laughs> no. Uh. <laughs> I mean, a little, but no, not really. Okay, no, there is only gay or not gay. There is not just a little. Well, there is not happening in real life, but plenty of fan fiction, yes. Oh. So <laughs> God, I fucking hate people who write that shit. <laughs> and while it's just them, Nathaniel has Herman cornered and just gushes over him. Just tons of compliments, I mean. And and then Nathaniel awkwardly awkwardly asks Herman if he's read any of his stuff, too. And Herman has to just be like, well, no. Well, upon his return from Pittsfield, Herman ordered some of Nathaniel's work from his publisher, at first reading Mosses from an Old Manse, which was a short story collection. Turns out Nathaniel Hawthorne was not just Herman Melville's number one fan, but Herman Melville was now Nathaniel Hawthorne's number one fan as well. Now, if you hadn't read uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's work from around this time period, it was the same year in 1850 that The Scarlet Letter had been published, and Hawthorne was a very brooding author, and Herming fucking dug it. Forever changed the story he was working on into the dark tale we have today. I would argue its mood is the reason it's so fucking good. But Nathaniel Hawthorne wasn't the only meeting that changed the course of Herman's work, or his life. During this trip uh, to these uh, little parties in Pittsfield with 31-year-old Herman, 28-year-old Lizzie, and their one-year-old son, Malcolm, they met the 28-year-old Sarah Morwood and her husband. Now, we don't know for sure that they were philandering at this point, but let's just say that the very next month after this quick New England tour, Herman borrowed tons of money from his father-in-law, Lemuel, and bought a farm with 250 acres in Pittsfield and moved his whole family there. What's more, he then borrowed more money from Lemuel to buy the farm property next to his, and then Sarah Morwood and her husband moved into that one. (laughs) Now look, I'm just going to say that I saw the photographs of the two women, and while Sarah's not anything to write home about, she's very pretty next to Lizzie. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. All right. And... While it has been technically unconfirmed to this day whether or not Herman and Sarah were fucking, we know that they remained very good friends, but there are some very suspicious letters between them. Throughout their correspondence, Herman calls Sarah, thou lady of all delight. Letter number four, thanks for the fucking. (laughs) The ever excellent. Letter number five, good job with that fucking. (laughs) Letter number six, more fucking. Let's meet again for that fucking. (laughs) He called her the thou lady of all delight the ever-excellent and beautiful lady of paradise, and more considerate of all their delicate roses. Yeah, he just said exactly that, but not funny. Yeah, that diffused their blessed perfume among men is Mrs. Morwood. Ugh. Oh, yeah, she's got a musk. (laughs) They They also went on a little overnight camping trip with some friends. Pass the whale oil deodorant. (laughs) Rub that. We, we got to look up what the <laughs> fuck they used that shit for. No, Was it I, just lamps. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Lamp like, soap. Maybe. I don't uh, like, no, 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 I don't fucking. Uh. No, it was. Uh, but every part of the whale was used pretty much like. No, part, you said they dumped the fucking carcass in the ocean. What do you mean? Every well, they part take of the whale they take some used? parts of it like the okay, like the some, rib- not all. Well, yeah, I know. 
Well, not all of it, all of it. I said the body once they're done with it. But either way, they take like rib bones and shit to use for uh, the linings of skirts and shit so that it's like blown out the way that they have in those old Victorian. Yeah, they they would make those hoop skirts out of like fucking whalebone. The fucking wood wasn't good enough for him. Jesus no. Christ. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, no, it's stupid. <laughs> but anyways, so Sarah Morwood and Herman also went on a little overnight camping trip with some friends. But Sarah and Herman didn't bring their spouses. They were the only ones not to. And apparently all those friends later wrote about how fucking awkward it was on that trip as well. So, you know, make up your own conclusions, but 100 percent. Make basically. up your own conclusions, <laughs> but we are 100 percent steering you towards that conclusion. That is absolutely happening. Yes. We just can't say for any definite but yes. Now, although Herman told his wife Lizzie that they were moving to Pittsfield because his new best friend Nathaniel Hawthorne lived nearby, the trysts between Sarah and Herman were not unknown to absolutely fucking everybody. As a matter of fact, a mutual friend of theirs named Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a book called Elsie Venner that may have been based on Sarah, which is about the title character, Elsie, being a strange fucking broad who has snake powers because her mom was bitten by a rattler when she was pregnant with her. Apparently the book caused a bit of a stir in their little friend group. Snake bitch. <laughs> <laughs> now the farmland that Herman Melville bought, he called Arrowhead and he called it this because of the arrowheads that kept cropping up during the excavation for the Holmes foundation. Almost like that land was being like it used to belong to somebody. Anyway, from the window uh, overlooking Herman's writing desk, he could spot Mount Greylock, the place where he probably fucked Sarah Morwood during that camping trip. The summit of the mountain could be seen rising over the heads of trees like the hump of a whale. And I'm not exaggerating that either. It really does look like a whale's back. And Herman, Herman enjoyed his quiet solitude on Arrowhead, pretending to be a farmer. Quote, I rise at eight, thereabouts, and go to my barn, say good morning to the horse and give him his breakfast, then pay a visit to my cow, cut up a pumpkin or two for her, and stand by to see her eat it, for it's a pleasant sight to see a cow move her jaws. She does it so mildly and with, with such sanctity. <laughs> I don't think he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Nathaniel Hawthorne, being in close proximity, a mere six miles away from Herman, meant that Herman could see Nathaniel at any time, which he did. However, as much of a fan as they were to one another, Nathaniel Hawthorne was 15 years older than Herman, and was easily agitated by this fucking youngster constantly bothering him at home. And honestly, Herman was probably just looking to collect father figures at this point. Now, it was while he was living at Arrowhead that Herman Melville was working on what would be called The Whale. But he was running into issues. See, buying land... And Wait, no, that title's not penis -y enough. Something's <laughs> missing. <laughs> See, buying land ended up being expensive. And he was borrowing from multiple people at this point, including his own publishers. So when he asked for an advance from Harper and Brothers on his new book, they said, no, you already owe us $700, dude. As a matter of fact, Harper and Brothers knew that Herman had a guy publishing his shit in England. And with his sales getting worse with each consecutive book, told him that they weren't going to print his next book until it gets printed in England. But because he couldn't get a single printing of his novel out of Harper and Brothers so he could send the work to England... He had to borrow even more money and set up a printing press at home. With his work finally printed a year after what he promised his English publisher, the whale was finally sent to England. Now, we'll go over the multiple differences that took place between the English and American versions of the book and what made this novel such a disaster in terms of sales as well as the author's well-being. But while this novel would be considered Herman Melville's downfall in life, this work would end up becoming what we regard as the great American novel. Released October 18th, 1851 in England, and November 14th in America, we are, of course, talking about the story of Moby Dick. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're not surprised? No. <laughs> and that's where we will go into uh, next week, or two I weeks mean, from I'm, now. I'm really fucking bummed that that literary classic is not called Mocha Dick, though. I mean... It would have been better. There's no problem with Moby Dick. I mean, it's not as funny. Mocha Dick was a real whale, though. I know. <laughs> That's fucking funny. <laughs> the white dick. Could have been. Could have been. Yeah. But no. Well. Well. Okay. 
See you I know two that, weeks. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are Dude, the now? bags under your eyes. I, I know yeah. that you just really want to get back to sleep. <laughs> I want to go back to bed while the laundry <laughs> finishes being done. I'm meeting my dad in like 30 minutes, man. Like, I'm tired. <laughs> I don't know if we should do this in the morning again. <laughs> it was the only available option. Yeah. I got I mean, shit to do. <laughs> you just tell your dad to fuck off? No. <laughs> What's he going to do? Stop being your dad? Uh, he's going to stop seeing me for like another two months. I don't oh. see my dad very often. So? Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dad, how do you feel about mocha dicks? Uh, Caleb won't want me to say it, but you can follow us on Twitter. You can see our um, hey, sources. Don't do that. Don't go there. See our sources. on. You um, need to just scrap that and start over because right now it's just a monument of fucking shame. And need failure. to see. <laughs> no, it's a lot start of Start interacting <laughs> with other accounts with the account. No one's just going to fucking go there and start liking the post you make. But I hate Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, then fucking delete it, man. It's just fucking t- tweet after tweet after tweet after tweet of you yelling into the void. I know. It's I such it. a bummer. <laughs> no, it's kind of fun. <laughs> Dude, no. Follow us and don't like anything. That's that's what we need to do. 